video game music isn't real music. I don't think that's something people, you know, say out of the middle of the street because, you know, who cares? Last of Us, you aren't, like, peeing your pants at the score, you're peeing your pants at the- <gasps> But as someone who listens to gaming music? Oh, it's got his own category on Spotify, thank goodness, so. Oh. Honestly, this is it. I've always felt insecure about listening to game music and saying it's some of my favorite, because I always felt like it was music, but with an asterisk. It's not because I think there's anything wrong with it, you just don't bring it up when people say, oh, what's your favorite music genre? Doesn't feel like it has the same value. Like, Georgia, I love you, but you are no donut planes. So yeah, saying it's not real music sounds dumb, but I feel like it's still not really treated or respected like contemporary music you hear on the radio or on your Spotify. Doja Cat's music is of the same caliber as Knuckles' Pumpkin Hill. So, I love this stuff in a deeper way than contemporary music, and you know, music is whatever you make of it. Often, it's attached to the experiences we have and the memories. So, saying you like music because of nostalgia is actually a bit more scientific than the comment section saying you just like it because of your rose-tinted glasses! Music processing is in the same part of the brain as emotional recall and long-term memory. The limbic. The limbic. The limbic! Oh my god, stop! But because music attaches itself to memories and emotion, it has proven to be the bridge for some neural networks that may have died. And even in some rehabilitation of those with dementia, it's proven to help them regain memories, or at least emotions attached to memories, which is truly magical. This suggests that music is somehow special and has neural protection in the brain. Music and the human mind is probably one of the most unique things we have as a species, and it may be the only thing that separates us from Diddy Kong. So in the realm of game music, I'd argue it may have more potential to evoke these experiences or emotions than contemporary music, you know, like music has to do all the carrying on its own. You may have an experience while you listen to that one Backstreet Boys song and that'll stay with you forever. But in games, the music is sort of insulation. Game music is designed with the experience of the game in mind and the emotions that they're trying to get you to elicit. Meaning, it has the potential to evoke so many more emotions, experiences, and ideas from you because it's attached to several different things. It's one thing to evoke emotion through a song through lyrics, chord progression, key, and instruments. It's another when it's meant to be used in tandem with visuals and storytelling. But why do I care so much? Look at me. It's my thing to care about this garbage. I think it all started for me when I used to play Super Smash Bros. Melee. Great first video game, and even better first soundtrack. Seriously, some of the best arrangements of these Nintendo songs, even to this day, are from this game. From there, I fell in love with gaming music and songs from games I liked, and games I didn't like. It truly inspires me when I dig deeper into a game's soundtrack to discover just how well thought the music was developed in order to match the gameplay. But <laughs> we are getting ahead of ourselves, okay? When did gaming beeps and boops start to become, uh, okay, well, I mean, it is music, technically. Well, it all depends on how right you want to be. And I know you guys love being right. So, what is the definition of music? Google, do not fail me now. Oh, wow, it's uh, it's exactly what I thought it was. This could be music. Now, if that's the case, gunfight. I'm putting it on my iPod. Space Invaders was one of the first games to utilize synthesized sounds to create environmental music that changed with the action. As you whittled down the enemies, the speed of the four, count them, that's four notes, would increase. And this speed increase alongside the enemies approaching you would create a sense of urgency, a physiological response to the action that's happening on screen. Pac-Man had music during the intermissions where it implies he fought. But for most people, these are just jingles. They're not full-blown. Oh my god, Final Fantasy. That is super, what the fuck? But for the sake of argument, and if I'm gonna convince you that this can be more than a bunch of then we're gonna need to, uh, gonna need to, uh, okay, actually, I think I need to get a cup of water. I know 
know nobody's leaping out of their chair at this fact, but the first song composed for Super Mario Bros. was the underwater theme. Koji Kondo said when making the first game's soundtrack, he began here because it was the easiest level to imagine music for. And I sort of get that. The gameplay was about floating and traveling through calm waters. The concept of water, openness, and progression, they're kind of easy to write for. This brings us to one of the first main methods in designing game music, which we're going to reference from the book, Writing Interactive Music for Video Games. Pretty on the nose. The two types of music, and if you've done film studies, you've probably heard of this, are diegetic and non, or extra diegetic music. Basically, diegetic music is music that exists within the game's universe that characters hear. But it can also be something that improves the area, like Persona 5 Royals. The Jazz Cafe has a singer there that the characters hear and talk about, but it's also something to set the mood of the area for you. Drink. Whereas non-diegetic is outside, it's meant to enhance what you're viewing on screen that isn't supposed to technically be within the universe of what you're viewing. It's not addressed in-game, and the characters aren't supposed to hear it... most of the time. Extra diegetic music is often used to enhance the emotions or actions a player is supposed to be feeling within a game. Uh, but this category is super broad because of that. What, what is James Pond Robocod trying to tell me with this music? I should go to hell? In the scope of film, extra diegetic music is meant to be an underscore. Sort of like editing, it's not supposed to be noticed and instead synchronized with the film's action to enhance whatever it is you're supposed to feel. Ah, Avengers Endgame, just as I remember. In a game though, making this music is a bit different. Films, they have one runtime, that's it. Everybody's watching the same runtime. But games, they can't possibly have music all synchronized for every part of the game because games are interactive. They can take as long as the player wants. This is where the practice of looping was implemented all the way back in the arcades, and it's still a standardized practice today. My point being that this all relates back to drowning. Because this was one of the first video games and video game levels where action and emotion were heavily considered. The underwater theme is separated into two channels, the and the and when we put it together they both swim in harmony going up and down riding along that C major chord it even sort of correlates to how Mario controls when you're swimming you need to press that A button a lot in order to go up otherwise he will float down slowly and the triangle channel usually used as bass lines on the NES the way it rides along, it sounds like blooping bubbles. And sort of reminds me of how these bloopers actually move in game. Then putting it all together, it really sounds like a harmony of swimming fishes in a wide open space as you gently move from left to right. Consider that these are the only levels in the first Mario game where you're not restricted by gravity. So, and no pun intended, they're refreshing. You don't feel as stressed when you're moving up and down. You feel like you have control of Mario in a realm that you didn't have before. And I think that's what this melody gracefully is trying to signify. That, in a sense, summarizes how Koji Kondo set out to write game music. When talking about the main theme, the iconic one, Koji Kondo explains that he intended to encompass the feeling of playing the game into the level's music. It isn't just something that was supposed to be there as, you know, background noise. It was literally designed with the intent that it matches how you feel when you're jumping, running, and stomping Goombas as Mario. So to summarize, gaming music often is about enhancing a feeling that the game is giving you. From there, gaming music was pretty much all about this in their music. Music that depicted the type of game you were playing, whether frantically dropping blocks, shooting lemons, or uh, whatever... what? And as games got more advanced, so too did the cues for music. Not only were there levels with songs that needed to be made for, but cutscenes. Action events. Menus, the pause screen. Sometimes in games, as you know, there aren't many places to see action. Congratulations, I'm sitting in this chair, what do you want me to do? <gasps> but the music is paramount in games without action, because it's about communicating the complex feelings without yelling at you, Hey! Hey! Did you know he's not the good one? Imagine Mario walked into Peach's castle and this is what played. Is he into me? 
This idea of positive and negative music that is so paramount for games in displaying cues for when a good event or a bad event is happening is actually rooted in film. In an experiment testing film scores and the positive and negative reinforcements they have, subjects would be shown two characters on screen with different accompanying music. And what was seen there was the positive soundtrack would imply a more intimate connected bond between these characters, whereas the negative music, there was a sense of tension, an uneasiness between the conversation, and that there could be a likelihood of violence. The point is, in games, this is entirely applicable, and arguably, it could be more paramount into selling an experience. Gears of War, for example, it's a shooter in ominous areas, but you know when you hear that... You're about to be in for some delicious strawberry shortcake. In Wind Waker, I remember specifically, there was the puppet Ganon fight and the three phases happened, but you're used to hearing the boss victory music until it warps into something completely different. It's this unsettling going beyond your expectations that's perfect for the final boss of the game to do, showing you a threat that goes beyond anything you were previously used to. There comes times when music can base how you feel about areas or characters, sort of like movies, which can change depending on the point of the story you're in. This is an effective use of leitmotifs. Essentially, you know how you recognize These are all leitmotifs, and they're used within games to change how a character is perceived in a different setting. Sometimes you'll hear it through different games over the years. Here's Princess Peach's theme in Super Mario 64. And here it is in Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. A popular one is Sans. No, really, that's the name of his, his song. When you first meet this character in the game, it's a happy-go-lucky skeleton, carefree, just doing goofy antics while you're hanging out with him. But you always sense there was something more to the character. This is hardly a spoiler at this point, but the leitmotif of Sans' theme is reused in Megalovania to be something much, much more tense. And it's incredible to me that the same set of notes can be altered into an entirely different song depending on the mood the game is trying to set. <laughs> oh, did you think I wouldn't make an appearance? Well, too bad. I'm alive. A game that effectively uses leitmotifs is Doki Doki Literature Club. It was a game that was popular until it wasn't. Thanks. Though it was a short visual novel, executing the writing and presentation well was so important in selling the game's story. It's also when things go horribly right. The player feels a sense of dissonance, which enhances the games and my appeal. Look at me, damn it! Dan Salvato created tension in the music through thoughtful theming and instrumentation. The main game's musical theme is emblematic of writing and creativity. It makes for the perfect tune to flirt with fake girls and fake write poems all before the fake story! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I think I'm still a little pent up. <laughs> well, at least you still have me. How does she keep doing this? When so focused like this, it can be internalized by players and leave them with a unique impression. Other visual novels do this as well. Catherine's climbing theme depicts your actions with this manic, unorthodox music. You're in a nightmare after all, and the music fits that incredibly well. And in Catherine's full body, to contrast this erratic climbing music, when you're close to the bottom, to your death, a new character starts playing this lovely piano ballad. And it's done only when you're close to the bottom, and it really does calm you down, giving you a time to think. Man, I just... I love this song. Alternatively, the theme at the bar Stray Sheep really communicates a drab energy for conversation in a bar full of misfits. It's not an upbeat or active bar. There's a lot of despair circulating all the characters when you speak to them. Ace Attorney, while not being an action-based game, uses music as an essential element in depicting information, as well as giving weight to the changing narrative as it unfolds in the courtroom. The theme cornered specifically given its in-game usage aligns perfectly with the feeling of triumph and discovery. Persona 5 soundtrack, okay, you knew it was coming, alright? Don't shut up. I mean, I love Persona 4 soundtrack too, so don't think that I think this one is better by any means, but I really think that Persona 5 is where Choji Meguro actually shined in displaying the themes of the game. 
Many of the most iconic songs from Persona 5 heavily remind me of the themes of spy thrillers, such as the 007 theme. Songs including powerful brass, violins, and active bass lines. It runs so parallel with our cultural themes of espionage, which lines up perfectly for a game about the Phantom Thieves. However, that's only half of the game. Welcome to this little thing called life! You're free to do whatever you want at this point of the game, and it becomes slow paced. Now instead of the commanding jazz instruments, it transfers the jazz instrumentation into some more calmer songs, almost being more ambient. From the high action stuff to the more contemplative stuff, it showcases that dichromatic soundtracks can really be effective in communicating dichromatic gameplay styles. All of this is to underline that games, and what they have the players do, has greatly expanded from Mario when he was just grabbing flagpoles. Soundtracks now aren't just needed for levels, they're needed for so many varying situations. I referenced this book, but there truly is no manual on how to design game music because it all comes from the standpoint on what your game is about. It has to align with the gameplay's elements, right? They made a level named after donuts! Extra diegetic music in games has expanded far into its own categories, but there are many games still that follow the traditional style of extra diegetic music in the form of AAA games. You know, every game where you're crawling through a rock to get to the next area. I obviously love the overly thematic stuff, but that's not to deny the hard work that goes into the other stuff. It is truly wonderful when a game's environment comes to life because of the instrumentation and score. And for more realistic games, it would sound kind of peculiar if it sounded like this. <laughs> But now that gaming has reached a noticeable climax in technical innovation, music has started retracing its steps. And instead of being entirely atmospheric or blatantly thematic, some of the best gaming soundtracks mix both of these values together and achieve something that's sort of in the middle. One of the largest and strongest examples in a game is about a destroyed civilization. Not that one. No. 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 Okay, that's, that's pretty funny. Breath of the Wild. It is an amazing soundtrack, but many fans, and I don't know if this holds true to this day, really didn't find it all that appealing because it wasn't as in your face as previous Zeldas. Because Breath of the Wild's core design was reliant on the ever-expanding world, the music was designed to let the environment speak. Many games that do this utilize innate noises we associate with feelings to elicit a reaction. Alarming short notes when things are afoot. Crescendo signifying something approaching. Little arpeggios as you're making progress. Breath of the Wild does a lot of this and many Zelda fans at first were not really a huge fan of this because they like the ooh, oh, ahi, where are we go? And the, oh yeah, I'm on water. I'm still, I'm still on water. Oh my god, can I, oh I can't. But Breath of the Wild begins this overworld theme with a series of chords and notes opening like a sunrise. Then the song is just a bunch of stray notes that pan from left to right with no real percussion and a series of random drones. It's trying to be the world, but also the game's music. Taking elements of thematic music, light motifs, but mixing it with ambient, more extra diegetic stuff that we know from films. While it has sound effects for the environment, the music really feels like the land is speaking to you. It reinforces the empty and expanding world of unpredictable findings with music that is unpredictable and beautiful and it directly contrasts the music when you encounter enemies. Oh, here comes the weird percussion and now the song ramps up. Unlike some other games where they play a typical battle theme in these situations, the song is a chaotic mess. It's still so brilliantly made. Battle is not supposed to be predictable and routine. So why would the music be? It's visceral and personal, wild and heart pumping. It's the perfect theme for these mindless idiot monsters to be attacking you with. It goes back to what I was saying, not all games have to have either the ambience or the tiddly diddly themes. Some individual songs sometimes mix all of these tenants together to make the perfect representation of both the mood, action, and the area you're in. But that's tough to do when you have a whole ass game to make. 
How can you do all of this where it ties to the gameplay but also its nice melodic music? This brings us to the last soundtrack I want to talk about. It brings together all of this stuff in a single set of levels that I believe masterfully captures the gameplay, story, and setting. Celeste is a game where our protagonist, Madeline, uh, that's uh, the redhead, no, the, the mountain's name is Celeste. I'm Canadian and I didn't even know this existed. But Madeline tasks herself with climbing Mount Celeste. There's no reason this is happening other than it's something that she needs to prove to herself, something only for her. The game's themes align with the many themes surrounding climbing and mountains, perseverance, overcoming oneself, and not giving up. This is all pretty telling if you see the gameplay, but Lena Rain, the composer, made sure that the music continuously reinforced these themes. The first level first steps has this naive optimism to it, while Reach for the Summit leads with a triumphant symphony as a declaration that I will conquer you. It's, oh, I love that song. But we're gonna focus on one of my favorite tracks. Madeline starts off asleep, and I mean, you'd be tired too after level one. I mean, look at her core strength. She starts off waking up from a sleep, but the area gets all weird and mysterious, and yes, she's dreaming, just roll with it. She runs in this barren area with mysterious flickering lights and falling stars behind. The music at this point is only really the piano and an additional synth thingy. Something's definitely weird. And then we find a mirror! Huh. I probably won't do anything, right? The music adds percussion in a synthy bass, sort of resembling this calm sleep turning into a whimsical dream. A new mechanic is implemented where we can do new platforming challenges, and the level shows you the varying ways you can use it. But the fun doesn't last long, as we get to the next section and realize the mysterious thing in the mirror was... us! Or I mean a part of us. And a slow version of the theme plays while she introduces herself. And the two's naturally opposing viewpoints come to pass. Madeline's, hey, I want to think positively. And Madeline's being like, hey, you uh, remember that one time you got dumped in grade nine? I'm gonna ruin your day. And ruin your day she does. The final part of this level simultaneously brings together all of the gameplay motifs you've been learning, as well as all the musical motifs in a faster, more frantic setting. You learn the simple stuff in a simple setting with a more simple arrangement, but now everything launches at you at full speed. Now that you know how to do all these challenges, they throw you into tighter rooms being chased by a clone of you, then two, then three. The song reflects this newfound chaos with a more frantic pace, sort of like a tumbling fall and the echoing choir chants that I can only imagine resemble these Madeline clones. If I were going to imagine what this music was going for, I'd probably bring to attention the story's theme of Madeline representing Madeline's anxiety, and how ugly it can make her when she's overwhelmed. I mean figuratively and literally, she self-sabotages herself through the entire game, and like, it makes her not believe in herself. Fuck! I thought this was a game about collecting strawberries, not self-reflection. Oh, I get it. As someone who's also struggled with their own mental health, feeling hopeless against what may seem like stuff that's out of your control or things that seem insurmountable, this game really struck a chord with me, especially with its themes on anxiety. It helped me come to peace with things I was struggling with, and this music will always be associated with that. Though this is one of my favorite songs from the game, the entire soundtrack is just as wonderful. It's peculiar how game composers go under the radar. We hear about the ones that develop their own games entirely, but never the ones who are solely responsible for creating these soundtracks, arguably the parts of the games we remember the most. I'd say game music can connect you more to a game because it's the thing that's associated with the action. Because we're invested into the games we're playing, the auditory stimuli shapes our perceptions of these games and our memories with it. I think that's why gaming crowds are often so nostalgic for gaming music, because while you may not remember the entire layout of a level, you'll always remember the song associated with it and how you felt when these songs played. Mario's music may be where we started the video, but it's actually where some of my earliest gaming memories lie. Super Mario World soundtrack is forever close to me because of the experiences I had with it. In childhood, I had the port on Game Boy, and it was my only gaming system at the time. I was hooked to this thing, and all I had were the noises coming out of the compressed speaker of the Game Boy Advance. And that's all I needed to be satisfied no matter where we went. 
In my childhood, this game was my escape from loneliness and gave me a sense of accomplishment and fulfillment, and probably shaped the games I like today. I know beating this boss is pedestrian today, but it was a big moment for me to try and strategize the fight and make sure I didn't die. And when I finally did it, the ending credits played, and this song is something that will stick with me forever because of that. It's an encore of a credit sequence showing you all of the enemies and areas you went through, tying a bow on the entire experience. This song specifically, still always thinking about it, makes me feel emotion, makes me feel happier. Songs from games transcend the gameplay and even stories they're from because it reminds you of points in your life. And while it may take another decade for gaming music to really be respected in the grander music world, video game music is just as real and just as valid as any other song. But because we share an experience in a game world with the song, it could immortalize the game and that experience in your heart forever. Play Persona 5, please. I don't know how to argue this anymore. <laughs> okay, that's it. <laughs> this video was sponsored by Raycon. Thanks, Raycon. Very fitting for the music topic, not planned, but it works out. These suckers are the everyday E25s. They're the latest and greatest model on the market when it comes to premium earbuds. On a single charge, you can get six hours of playtime out of them when you charge them in this lovely little shell. I don't know what it is about this thing, it's cute. I wanna put some googly eyes on them. I just moved if you didn't know, and I had something like a six hour period where I was just unpacking everything. And these guys survived the journey. They kept me from going insane. Seriously, I couldn't find me Costa's hair for a week. The noise isolation is always surprising to me. It's absolutely amazing. You won't hear anything outside, so you can zone out with panel de pan, you know, Raycon in the ears and lip on the sticks. Also, they have a few different fits for the earbuds, so you can find your perfect size, but honestly, I use the original ones, and I haven't had a problem with them. Finally, these guys start at about half the price compared to other wireless earbuds on the market. I've heard only good things from fans who have gotten the Raycons for themselves, so go to raycon.com slash relaxalax to get 15% off your next purchase on Raycon wireless earbuds. The link is in the description, and thank you to Raycon for the opportunity. So uh, that's the rebrand. I hope you like it. I am taking on a different philosophy as I make videos going forward. And the core of it is just honesty, making my videos something I believe in and having messages within them that I truly believe in. This one was about the power of game music, using science and my own experiences to try and explain to you just how impactful music can be. And I hope it put a smile on your face like some of my favorite songs do for me because sometimes those experiences when we are suffering hard times like we are today, I know I am, um, we need to turn to something and game music has constantly been something I turn to. So please cherish those memories and know that they're valid and please go in peace, spread love, not hate. This has been Alex and I'll see you on the flip side.